Kentucky President Eric Isaacs. Good afternoon. On behalf of all of us here at Carnegie Institution for Science, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this virtual lecture. This is the latest of our new series of talks by some of our world-renowned researchers. Today, we're going to hear from two of our renowned astronomers, Gwen Rudy and Nick Conaderis. Nick and Gwen are part of a team that is building a new world-class instrument for our 6.5 meter Magellan telescopes at our Las Campanas Observatory in Chile. As you probably know, astronomers rely on massive telescopes to observe the many kinds of objects in our universe, from the stars and their planets in our own Milky Way galaxy to the most distant galaxies and massive black holes. Those large telescopes are equipped with a wide array of highly sophisticated instruments that collect an astounding amount of information about those faraway objects. The two scientists who will speak today are leading the effort to build a new generation of instruments for Carnegie's extraordinary telescopes. Gwen Rudy refers to herself as a galaxy hunter. Her work focuses on the chemical and physical properties of very distant galaxies. She first began working with us at Carnegie as a Carnegie Princeton postdoctoral fellow, and she joined us as a staff member in 2015. Gwen holds a bachelor's degree from Dartmouth College and a PhD from Caltech. Nick Conadaris is an astronomer who works with his colleagues at Las Campanas to create new optical instrument, optical instrumentation projects. Right now, he is working on a powerful new infrared spectrograph. Nick holds a bachelor's degree in physics from Carnegie Mellon University and a PhD in astrophysics from UC Santa Cruz. After a postdoc at Caltech, he worked at Planet Labs and Kairos Aerospace, and Nick joined us here at Carnegie in 2017. Like you, I am looking forward to hearing Gwen and Nick talk about the way these powerful new instruments are deepening our understanding of the universe's early galaxies. So please join me in welcoming Gwen Rudy and Nick Conaderis. Hello everyone. Uh, so today we'll tell you about our presentation, Seeing with New Eyes, Outfitting a Telescope for a New Era of Discovery. So for an observational astronomer, um, it's great fun to work at a place like Carnegie uh, because Carnegie runs one of the premier locations for doing astronomy in the entire world. It's called Las Campanas Observatory and it's located in the Andes Mountains in Northern Chile. So at LCO, the calm, dry air on our mountaintop leads to some of the best conditions for professional astronomy. There are four large telescopes on site there and a bunch of smaller ones. These photographs shown here are of two of our largest, the twin Magellan telescopes, which have mirrors that are 21 feet across. Telescopes are one of the main tools of astronomers. We use them to collect data on all kinds of different astronomical objects. Instruments are the devices that go onto the back of a telescope, and they're responsible for collecting light and recording images. When you pick up binoculars or look through a backyard telescope, your eye serves as the instrument. Here on the left, we see a picture of an astronomer looking through the Magellan six and a half meter with an eyepiece. This is kind of a fun throwback to a previous era astronomers stopped eyepiece observing over a century ago. You just never really see these on a modern telescope. Instead of eyepieces, we tend to use the things like what are shown on the right in a computer model. It's the same telescope, but here the eye is replaced with a machine the size of a small car. It's made of optics, electronics, and detectors, and it allows us to see things that our eyes simply can't. This drawing shows the instrument we will focus on today, MIRMAS, the Magellan Infrared Multi-Object Spectrograph. This machine will enable all of the science that you're going to hear about today. So it's worth understanding the two most special aspects of this instrument. First, it's a spectrograph. And second, it sees infrared light. So what do those terms mean? Light is comprised of many different colors. Our eye can see blue through red. Beyond blue is normally called ultraviolet and beyond red is called infrared. The instrument we're talking about today sees the infrared light 
and it splits it into the colors and records the intensity of those colors in what's known as a spectrum. So look at this figure, white light from a star goes through a prism and it gets spread out into a rainbow. If you simply plot the intensity of the signal as a function of the color on that rainbow, you have a spectrum. But why do we care about these spectra? Well, it turns out that spectra allow us to measure a wide range of things. We don't have time to go into all of them today. So we'll just focus on the motions of distant galaxies, which spectra can measure, as well as the composition of atmospheres for planets outside of our solar system. So Nick and I actually met a while ago uh, while we were both at Caltech working on an instrument called MOSFIRE, which is what's shown here. It's the big blue thing with all of the weird cables and so forth attached to it. Um, so at the time, Nick was a postdoc and I was a graduate student. Nick, um, as Eric mentioned, specializes in building instruments and I mostly study distant galaxies. But the reality is that observational astronomers like myself are always interested in how to make our telescopes more powerful. And building a new instrument for one of them is one of the main ways we can make a telescope have new capabilities. So ever since I joined Carnegie in 2013, I wanted to have access to a more powerful version of MOSFIRE. And when Nick joined our staff in 2017, I really jumped at the chance to start working with him on this project. So we thought it might be interesting to the audience today to hear about an how an observational astronomer like myself and an instrumentalist like Nick dream up a new instrument for one of the large telescopes. So today we'll tell you about just two characteristics of this new spectrograph we're building from Magellan called MIRMOS and how they're driven by some really cool science we'd like to do in the future. All right, so jumping right in, the first topic we'll cover today is my favorite, the formation of galaxies. So to understand this story, there's one more really important concept to understand, and that's that telescopes are time machines. So light travels at a specific finite speed. And so the farther away we look in space, the farther back in time we see. I mostly study the very distant universe, or said another way, I study the young universe. The light I collect with the Magellan telescopes has been traveling to us for about 10 billion years. So I see the universe as it was 10 billion years ago, when galaxies like our own were born and formed many of its stars. And as someone who studies galaxies, one of my big questions is how important to the sort of life story of galaxy is the location where it was born. So for people, we know the experiences of children who grow up in cities are different from those who grow up in the countryside. And the question is, is the same true for galaxies? And in fact, we know it is. When we look around the universe today, nearby galaxies that are found in high density regions of the universe, uh, what we call galaxy clusters, or today I'll refer to as galactic cities, look different from other types of galaxies. So this fact was first discovered by another Carnegie astronomer, my colleague, Alan Dressler in the 1980s. But the question is, well, why do they look this way? And to answer that, one of the best ways is to look back in time to when the universe was younger and identify the galactic cities as they're being built. So this slide shows the largest detailed map of the distant universe ever made. This is part of the Lattice Project, which is led by Carnegie astronomer Drew Newman, Guillermo Blanc, and myself. In this plot, galaxy cities are shown in red with suburbia shown in green and the galaxy countryside shown in blue. When complete, Lattice will map 10 trillion times the volume of our own galaxy, the Milky Way. This map will uncover something like 100 new galactic cities never known before. And each of those will contain hundreds of galaxies. But to study the galaxies within these cities in detail, we really need more information. So here I'm showing just one of those galactic cities we found so far with Lattice. It's the red blob in the middle of this panel. And I'm comparing it here to the size of the full moon to give you a sense of its size on the sky. So we'd like more information on the galaxies within this city. But the problem is these galactic cities are really, really large. Well, why is that a problem? And here's the issue. 
The problem is that most instruments can only see a small part of any one of these cities at a time. So studying all of the galaxies within them just takes an extraordinarily long time. The gray box that I'm showing here shows the area on the sky that the existing spectrograph we talked about before, MOS fire, that Nick and I helped build at Caltech can see. So this box is drawn to scale compared to the moon and to my galactic city. Now the area that an instrument or telescope can see at a given time is called the field of view. So the problem is that the field of view of MOS fire is far too small for the project I'd like to do. So now I have a problem that I can take to my colleague, Nick, and say, hey, Nick, how can we build a new instrument that can see more of the sky, one that has a larger field of view? Yeah, I'm glad that you asked Gwen. Actually, Gwen asked me this question a few years ago, and it's a real doozy. The challenge when designing spectrographs is always the design and construction of these very specialized cameras. What you see here is a computer model of a camera comprised of seven lenses. The front element is seven inches in diameter, which is way bigger than say a Canon lens. Light comes in from the right and is bent towards the detector on the left. The challenge in the infrared, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later, is that this lens is kept at minus 240 degrees Fahrenheit. At this temperature, the lenses, which are made of exotic infrared transmitting materials, are fragile, and so the design is really challenging. This lens in particular takes a beam of light that's five inches in diameter and focuses it down to a spot that's five microns in diameter. Five microns is 20 times thinner than a piece of copy paper. The title for this camera says fast, which is a photographic term, meaning how much light gathering power your lens has. We operate at f 1.3, which for photographers in the room means fast, but to put that into context for non-photographers, as far as I know, a lens that works at this temperature with the required field of view and with this fast speed has never been made before. And our group is one of the few that can build such a lens, which is very fortunate for us because we're now enabled to have a very wide field of view and can observe over a huge range of colors. And this is just critical in order to study galactic cities. So I was really thrilled with Nick's design, which we show here its field of view in the colored boxes next to our galactic city from Lattice. In the end, our instrument can see about two and a half times as much sky as the previous spectrograph, but even better, it can also observe four times as many colors at once. And this is really a tremendous gain for being able to study these galactic cities. So now moving on to a completely different topic, characterizing other worlds. So one of the fun things about serving as an instrument scientist, which is the role that I play for MIRMOS, is that I get to learn about science far outside of my specialty to help guide the design of an instrument. So one thing I've been learning a lot about recently is the study of other worlds or exoplanets as we call them. So some of you may have seen this image before in a press release from Carnegie. Two of our awesome postdocs, Johanna Teske and Sharon Wang, have been using the Magellan telescopes to search for and study new and interesting planets. This artist's conception shows a newly discovered solar system first detected with Magellan and confirmed with TESS, an exoplanet satellite launched by NASA. So when I talk with my colleagues studying exoplanets like Johanna and Sharon, one of their big questions is, do planets like these have atmospheres? And if so, what are they made out of? The neat thing is that there's a really promising technique called transmission spectroscopy that relies on detecting the molecules that make up the atmosphere of other planets by looking for the shadow they cast in the light from their parent star. But the challenge is that the shadow from the molecules only affects a tiny fraction of the star's light just one ten thousandth of the light at some very specific colors, all of which are in the infrared. So astronomers like Johanna and Sharon need to be able to, to measure the light from these stars much more precisely than that number in order to confirm the presence of these shadows and say conclusively if a planet has an atmosphere or not. So Nick, how can we do that? Yeah, I love this exoatmosphere topic because while in principle, it has been possible to do this measurement from the ground, no one has really yet cracked the nut on how to do it well enough. Well enough allows us to measure 
literally how many molecules of things like methane and carbon dioxide and water and titanium dioxide and all kinds of other molecules exist in the exoplanet's atmosphere. Our measurement has to be good to something like 50 parts per million. So to put that into perspective, imagine measuring my height, then you put that piece of copy paper, which we talked about before on my head and measure the difference. The change to my height is 50 parts per million. This high fidelity measurement is enabled by a lot of different techniques. One of the most important ones is ironically smearing out the light. We put this piece of glass, which you see in the picture on the left in the beam coming from the telescope. And what it does is it kind of spreads the light out a little bit. I called this ironic because we put a huge amount of effort into making a camera that delivers this tiny little five micron diameter image. And then we spread it out, why? Well, as you can see in this video, the focused light dances around as the atmosphere is blowing around above our telescope. The dancing is beautiful, it's why stars twinkle. But what happens is it moves the light across the detector. And instead of measuring the exo-atmosphere, we measure the location and the size of the spot on the detector. On the right, you see what happens after you put the diffuser into the beam and smear it out. Notice that the diffused beam barely changes. This means that we can now reliably measure the signal. The amazing thing is that with this diffuser in place, MIRMOS will be able to measure molecules in the atmosphere of all kinds of different planets, from planets more massive to Jupiter in our own solar system, to those more like Neptune and even mini Neptunes and things called super Earths. This is awesome because space missions like Kepler and TESS are uncovering hundreds of extrasolar planets and with MIRMOS will have the key to surveying their atmospheres. So, so far we've told you about two of the really powerful aspects of a new instrument we're now working on called MIRMOS, the Magellan Infrared Multi-Object Spectrograph. These uh, are the very wide field of view, which is enabled by that fast camera, which I showed you a picture of before, which allows us to study the fundamental building block of our universe, these very, very faint galaxies. And the diffuser that I just mentioned which allows us to do very precise measurements of the composition of planetary atmospheres. Sorry, thanks, Gwen. Um, but as you might imagine, our wish list is a lot longer. There are a lot of other design challenges to discuss, but I'm going to pick a few more that are of broad interest. I mentioned before that the instrument has to work in the infrared, and many of us know that heat emits infrared light. Well, our detector is so sensitive that at room temperature, it would see the walls of the room hundreds of times brighter than any of the objects that we're looking at. This means that the whole instrument has to be kept extremely cold. So how do we do that? Well, what we do is we build the instrument inside of a vessel called a doer. It's a fancy term for a thermos. The doer is shown in blue, and this allows us to cool the instrument down to minus 240 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a vacuum vessel, meaning that air can't get in. If it did, the air would instantly freeze on our optics. Actually, the water in the air would instantly freeze on our optics and on our detectors and destroy them. Obviously, that's not good. So there's just a huge challenge associated with keeping the instrument cold. You see the little cans on the very right-hand side of the instrument? Those are our specialized coolers, which are needed to keep the instrument at minus 240 Fahrenheit. Also, just like Gwen mentioned before, we want MIRMAS to be able to see a lot of different colors of light at once. So here in the figure, we show MIRMAS, the little model of it. Light is coming from up into the right and going down into the left. And we've drawn this kind of wavy rainbow that's moving into the instrument. In order to see a broad range of colors, we've implemented a technology called dichroics, where light is split into one of two colors. Blue light goes one direction, red light goes another. And we've nested several of these dichroics, which allows us to split the light into five color groups at the same time. 
This is critical for the science that we wanna do. But it also means we have to build five of the cameras like the one I showed you before. Obviously, we have a lot of work to do. There is a lot more amazing features of Miramas that we could discuss in the Q&A section, but we don't have time to talk about fully during the lecture portion. But here's a movie of the instrument rotating around on the deck of our telescope platform. You can see the front window, the optics, the detectors, the cooling mechanism, the dichroics, all kinds of other stuff shown in this computer rendering. Light will come from the furthest reaches of our universe, enter the instrument, and land on one of our detectors. Today, we talked about two ways in which our scientists will use MIRMAS, studying the most distant galaxies and measuring the composition of atmospheres of planets outside of our solar system. The miracle is that with a few years of very, very hard work, we will convert these computer files into an actual pile of metal and electronics and detectors, which will enable thrilling discoveries. So just like it takes more than an instrument builder to dream up a new instrument for Magellan, it takes a whole team to design one in detail and then an even bigger one to build it. So Nick and I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the huge effort that's been put into this project so far by these four additional individuals. Drew Newman, who's my co-project scientist, Jason Williams, who's a graduate student working at Carnegie, Tyson Hare, who's our lead engineer, and Alicia Lands, who's a postdoctoral fellow working with us on Miramas. And there's many more not mentioned here. Yeah, and thank you so much everybody for your attention. I just wanna point out a few last things. If all goes well, we will take our first spectrum with Miramas in December of 2024. We're looking for various avenues to fund the instrument, including submitting a huge proposal to the National Science Foundation, which is due this coming Wednesday. And we're looking forward over the coming years to tell you more about the instrument and the science that we can accomplish with it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gwen and Nick, for um, taking time to talk to us today when you have a big proposal due. So we really appreciate it. And this was a great presentation. Um, we do have one funny comment that I wanted to point out before I get started with the questions that an anonymous person said that you guys are way cooler than the astronomers they see on TV. So <laughs> I thought you might enjoy that. Um, we have a lot of questions, so I'm just gonna... Uh, I'll just say that we are less cool than the coolest astronomers we know. <laughs> that is certainly true. Um, so we have a lot of questions. I'm going to try to combine some of them so that we can uh, get to, uh, to more folks and make sure they get answers. Uh, so one that I think relates to a lot of what you talked about is that people want to know um, why you chose to focus on infrared and also if it's possible that the spectrum extends further than we currently are aware. Uh, Nick, would you like to take that one or would you like me to? Sure. Um, definitely light from these objects is emitted in all the electromagnetic wavelengths that you could possibly detect, all the way from the x-rays to the far radio. Not only electromagnetic, but they emit in uh, gravitational waves and uh, uh, cosmic rays and all kinds of other ways to detect the objects. So picking one electromagnetic band has to do a little bit with the type of observation you want to do and the technology that you kind of limit yourself to. In essence, with the type of telescope we have, Magellan, it's really optimized for optical and infrared observations for a variety of kind of technical reasons. And so you can't observe any of the other wavelengths easily from Magellan. In addition, the detectors that go into Miramas operate at 120 Kelvin or minus 240 Fahrenheit. And so you're basically kind of limited by um, the sort of overall architecture of the, of the instrument when you, when you start off. But one thing I'll add to that is that a lot of, um, you know, while there's a lot of technical considerations about uh, operating a, a telescope and an instrument for the infrared, uh, there's a lot of science gains in, in really focusing on that wavelength range. Uh, so much so that there's actually a new, uh, a new space telescope, very much like the Hubble Space Telescope called the James Webb Space Telescope that's being launched uh, very shortly that focuses on this exact same wavelength band. 
And the reason why that's so interesting is that when we are interested in studying the very, very distant universe, galaxies um, at those distances, actually most of their light we see as infrared light. Um, and so that's really important. And as we highlighted here, if you're interested in studying molecules in the atmospheres of other stars, you have to look in the infrared. That's the only place where those signals exist. And so um, we can see different things with optical light, the light that we see with our eyes, than we can see with infrared light. Um, but in the case of a lot of different science questions we have, you really have to have the infrared part of the spectrum in order to, to make any measurements about these kinds of quantities. Since you mentioned uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, we do have a question about that uh, from Mark, who wants to know if it would be possible to put a component on it that would enable us to take images of Earth at the same time as the telescope is doing its work. I am definitely sure it's possible. <laughs> but they, they won't do it. They pro yeah, yeah. probably won't. It's, do it. it's almost ready to be launched. So I don't <laughs> think they'll be doing that. But we actually do have a very large number of instruments that stare at the Earth pretty much all the time, though. Uh, not astronomers, but, uh, but other scientists do. And on the more technical side, we have a number of people who were very intrigued by Nick's description of the cooling process and wondered if you could talk a little bit more about how you accomplish that and what you used to uh, enable the cooling. Yeah, so there's these devices that you buy, they're called closed cycle refrigerators, CCRs. They operate by a mechanical motion, which mechanically pulls the heat out of the viewer, and then it gets dumped somewhere inside of the dome in a place that we can control. And the reason you want that is because you don't want to just dump heat into the dome because that will mess up the quality of your images. So it takes that heat and it throws it far outside of the telescope. And um, these devices have a tip that goes inside of the doer and the tip of that device is something like uh, 60 Kelvin and it just sucks all the heat outside of it. That's completely wild. I. <laughs> would like to see it. <laughs> yeah, I noticed somebody asking about liquid nitrogen. And so that's another way that you can typically cool these, but having these mechanical approaches makes the reliability of the instrument a lot easier. And then uh, I, it would be remiss if I didn't ask this question from Bob, which is, would it be possible to use Miramos on the Giant Magellan Telescope when uh, that is completed? Yeah, you just have to change a few things, which um, you can totally do and put it on the GMT and use it if you like to. And as a matter of fact, in our proposal, we mentioned that this is a little bit of a pathfinder for instruments on much larger telescopes. It's in fact, the very last line in our proposal. So. <laughs> and we have an email question from Lucy who wants to know, are there uh, telescope instruments which are we are capable of conceiving of right now, but uh, not able to construct for whatever limitations at this time? That's a really interesting question. I think the most fundamental limitation I can think of is generally getting the financial resources together and the human resources together to build something. The, I, another way possibly to think about it is we're, we're very much limited by detector technology and glass technology. And so if somebody could magically wave a wand and change those things, we could definitely build even more powerful instruments. And there's a lot of research that goes into that kind of work. I know, Gwen, if you want to take your own stab at that. Uh, I think that sounds about right. I mean, astronomers dream up all kinds of crazy ideas all of the time uh, for things that we'd like to build. And usually the limitations are, are financial, like, like Nick said. We don't have infinite money to build uh, a hundred meter telescope, which is a, a project that has been, uh, has been mentioned before by astronomers. Um, but I think there are one of the things that you learn when you're an instrument scientist is there are real technical limitations that 
that there's a whole, you know, research and development groups across the country and across the world that are working really hard, um, really, really hard on. And in fact, the, the specialized detectors that are going to be in Miramas, those haven't existed for very long. Um, and so uh, when, when Nick and I were working on MOSFIRE, they were sort of brand new. And that new technology was really enabling a whole new era of, of infrared astronomy. Um, and now we can use those detectors in an even more powerful instrument and then have yet a whole nother new era of astronomy. And so this is sort of the way um, astronomers uh, make progress, observational astronomers make progress as we sort of stand on the shoulders of previous giants, um, trying to use the technologies that have been built in the past to see farther and see fainter than we have been able to see before. And we have a question from David who wants to know what the uh, impact of Earth's atmosphere will be on the capabilities of your instrument. So that's a great question. And um, we designed the entire instrument essentially keeping in mind the fact that we have to look through Earth's atmosphere, which in some ways is great. We like having an atmosphere to protect us from the sun. But it, for an astronomer, sometimes it's a real bummer because it blacks out whole sections of the infrared spectrum and you can't see it at all. And then also there's little parts of our atmosphere that actually glow. And so there's very specific colors in the infrared that are either black from, from outer space, we can't see them because the atmosphere absorbs it, or they're glowing extremely brightly because of the air. Um, and so that, that makes a, an a actual extreme challenge um, for infrared astronomy. But essentially um, what we've done as part of these science cases is look for creative ways to solve those problems. And so the biggest issue is if you're trying to see a, a feature, a, a particular color of light um, or a particular element say, or, or molecule that has a, a feature in our own earth's atmosphere. So for instance, trying to see water on other planets can be challenging because there's water in our atmosphere. Now, thankfully there are ways around this and um, with some of the very uh, very precise instrumentation that we're, we're including in Miramas, we believe we'll still be able to get around that. But it is an, an excellent question and a very significant challenge, one that's taken sort of decades to solve. Um, but, uh, but astronomers are, are very clever and, uh, and spend a lot of time thinking about these sorts of things. Um, and so, uh, so this is a, a problem that, that we have at least a workaround for. That's something I love about this talk is it's kind of showing us that problem solving troubleshooting mindset that all astronomers have to exist in. Um, so similar build off the last question, we have a couple people who are asking wh why wouldn't you uh, just build this for a space telescope to begin with? Um, it, why focus on a land-based telescope? I think I know the answer, but I'll allow you to answer it. So I think it's it's really two things. So um, one of them is is cost. So it's very expensive to launch things um, up, you know, out of out of the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and so that's that's part of the the answer. And every time we do that, the mission lifetime is limited, and and all sorts of things like that. You also can't tinker very much with things in space. It's very hard. Um, so you guys might be aware that the Hubble Space Telescope has had multiple resurfacing missions where we actually sent astronauts up in order to install new instruments on the telescope, which has been wonderful and has uh, greatly extended the life of Hubble. But people have to risk their life to do that. Um, and so that's a, a really hard thing. Um, and also you can't all of the technology that we launch into space has to be sort of highly vetted and highly tested. And so you can't do new uh, groundbreaking experiments usually in space on large missions like James Webb Space Telescope, because everything has to, we have to know that it's gonna work um, because the costs are so high. And that's a big part of it. It's just really expensive, right? Um, to, to send things up into space, so. I figured the answer would be cost related. <laughs> As it is. Um, so we have a question. Uh, someone, uh, Lee, is asking, you know, you have explained how you work in the infrared and uh, other astronomers use different tools, uh, x-rays, microwave. Is there any thought that there will ever be um, 
a facility that can do all or multiple of those at one time, or is that just not possible? Yeah, I'm looking at Lee's question now. That's a real question for aficionados. I like it. Um, so the answer is that on a single platform, just because we're behind a telescope, you can't do things like observe X-ray and microwave uh, simultaneously. So you sort of need different types of telescopes in order to uh, observe across those wavelengths range simultaneously. And then also some of those wavelengths don't penetrate our atmosphere. And so you need to be above the atmosphere in order to see them. And so for those reasons, you can't simply combine everything into just one big monster instrument. On the other hand, to a large degree, Miramas is doing the hyperspectral thing in the sense that we're observing a, a, a very broad wavelength range all the way from what is uh, just barely beyond your eye into out to two and a half microns in wavelength. So it's, um, we're, we're doing it to the level that it sort of makes sense for the type of science that we wanna do. And uh, Kevin asks, um, what will happen to the original MOSFIRE instrument? Will it just sort of be no longer useful or will it be reused in other telescopes um, going forward once uh, MIRMAS would come online? Uh, so MOSFIRE sits on a different telescope. It doesn't sit on the Magellan telescopes. It sits on the Keck telescopes, where, which are located in Hawaii. Um, and different astronomers use the Keck telescopes sometimes than use the Magellan telescopes. And also you can see a different part of the sky from Hawaii than you can see from Chile. Um, so we can see different parts of our own galaxy, for instance, from the Southern hemisphere. And that's one of the main motivations, in fact, originally for Carnegie moving to the Southern hemisphere and having an observatory at Las Campanas. Um, and so MOSFIRE will still be useful and it will still be used by astronomers, um, absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, this is sort of, there will be things that MOSFIRE can't do that we'll be able to, to do with MIRMOS, um, but, but uh, people have creative ways of using instruments for, for interesting new projects, and I'm sure it will still be used uh, frequently by, by the community of astronomers that use the Keck telescopes. We have a question from Stuart who asks uh, where the components of MIRMAS are fabricated and by whom? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, that's a great question. This is a worldwide effort. We have components being built by an organization in Switzerland, which uh, came out of the Swiss watch making uh, industry. Uh, we plan to have something that will be built either at MIT or in France that uh, slices up the light in very specific ways. Uh, many of the optics will be uh, fabricated somewhere in the United States, most likely. Um, we've been talking to vendors in Rochester, New York, which is a very famous place for fabrication of optics. And um, many of the mechanical pieces will be built out of our own machine shop in Santa Barbara Street in Pasadena or at a local shop in Los Angeles. So we've been talking to a variety of vendors that build uh, components. So it's, uh, it's a huge effort from uh, people all over the world. We all love stories of international collaboration at Carnegie. So thank you, Nick. Uh, so we've had a lot of questions on the technical side um, on the discoveries side, we have one from Richard who wants to know, uh, you talked about um, looking to detect things from uh, exoplanet atmospheres. Are there specific molecules that you're hoping or expecting to find? Yeah, absolutely. So um, water is a big is a, a big goal. Um, we you know we think water is important for life, and so that's that's one of the goals of Miramas. Um, but there are other a whole bunch of other uh, molecules like methane and CO two that are of interest. Um, we really just don't even know what's out there. Uh, we don't know what kinds of processes occur on um, on exoplanets that might seed their atmospheres with different kinds of elements. Um, there's there's just a whole world of questions in this regime because there's so very little measurement. So we have a lot of different theories. Um, the, the sort of third, the third wheel of, of astronomers between Nick and me would be a theorist um, who, who does cal do calculations or run computer simulations. Um, 
And those people have been running amok in the exoplanet community because there's so little data and such wild imagination that exists amongst humans. And so people have really wonderful and amazingly speculative ideas about what might happen on, um, on planets that orbit around other stars. And until we go out and make the measurements, it's really hard to say which of those things are possible and which aren't. Gwen, we have a number of people who are really interested in the galactic city metaphor that you used. And uh, I wonder if you could expand on it a little bit and just talk about, um, a lot of people are wondering about the size, what qualifies something as a galactic city. And um, I guess that would be the number one question is the, the size and also just how you, if you could expand on this metaphor a little bit, we have probably 10 questions about this. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Um, so there's actually a lot of different ways of defining uh, these sorts of things, these galactic cities or what we call galaxy clusters. Um, and that's in part because there's a lot of different ways to detect them. Um, so in the, in the more local universe, we were talking previously about things like X-rays and gamma rays, and you can actually use those kinds of experiments to see the hot gas that fills up uh, galaxy clusters in the nearby universe. And so some of um, the sort of methods for defining a galaxy cluster actually have to do with that. Um, and others have to do with the action of, of gravity. So if something is sort of, um, uh, has been around for sufficiently long that gravity has sort of acted to its fullest extent on this, on this structure, um, then that might be considered uh, a real galaxy cluster. Now, everything that I talked about today in this very distant universe is actually what we call a proto cluster. So it's sort of like a building or budding galactic city. Um, and we think those are actually really important places because uh, we believe that it may be at those locations as these uh, cities are actually being formed, as people are sort of, the galaxies are kind of commuting into the city, um, that the really interesting interactions between galaxies and so forth might be happening that actually cause these changes that we see in galaxies. Um, and so, uh, so I don't know if that exactly answers people's questions, but the, the general idea is that there's actually many ways to define them. Um, in this particular uh, presentation, the technique that we use is actually, again, searching for shadows. So I didn't mention this before, but the, the map that we see here, the, the dark uh, red regions um, that I showed previously that are um, our galactic cities are actually locations where a very specific color of light is taken away uh, by cosmic gas, neutral hydrogen gas that pervades the entire universe and exists in higher abundance in galactic cities. And that's because hydrogen makes up the majority, um, the majority of the universe. And that hydrogen is actually one of the main building blocks of stars and galaxies and planets and everything else in our universe. And so there's a whole bunch of raw material sitting around in higher densities in regions that have more galaxies, these galactic cities. And so we can actually look for the light that's taken out of background sources at that very specific color um, and make a three-dimensional map of the universe. And that's what the Lattice Project does. It uses a technique called Lyman Alpha Tomography, um, which is just a fancy way of saying, mapping out those shadows in color space. I also sort of wanna point out something which I think is really interesting is that this whole concept is not really that old. Uh, there's a famous series of papers written by Alan Dressler and his colleagues in the eighties that describes this type of measurements. And uh, as a matter of fact, if people are really interested in this, there's a really beautiful book called Voyage to the Great Attractor, something like this by Alan, um, that you can read from the library, which uh, talks about this uh, in a lot of detail. Thank you so much. And for those listening in who don't know, Alan Dressler is a uh, staff member emeritus. So he is from the family. Um, so we only have time for one more question. There are so many that we didn't get to. So if anyone wants to have their questions answered by Gwen and Nick after the program, please email your questions to events at carnegiescience.edu and we will uh, make sure that those questions get answered for you. We really appreciate everyone tuning in. Um, so for the last question, uh, it's 
a little bit of a of a timely one where it notes that um, you're clearly both in your homes um, and they want to know under normal circumstances when astronomers aren't at the telescope, what is their uh, daily work like? Sure. So I imagine Nick's answer depends pretty highly on whether he's actually building an instrument or designing one. Uh, but for me, most of my time is actually spent either talking with postdocs and students that I work with um, or uh, uh, sitting in front of a computer and analyzing the data that we take from these telescopes um, in order to turn them into discoveries, basically. So, um, you know, a, a very privileged astronomer, like a Carnegie astronomer, um, might get 10 or if they're very, very lucky, 20 nights on a telescope as big as this. And so we don't actually spend all that much time at the telescope, but every single little speck of light that hits our mirror on these telescopes are very, very precious to us because they can tell us all kinds of interesting things. And so we spend a very large amount of time actually delving into the details of these data in order to be able to understand what, what, those, um, what those rays of light are telling us about the distant universe or nearby planets or whatever uh, an astronomer happens to study. Nick, I don't know if you want to talk about building it. Yeah, instrument. sure. Um, I'm very heavily involved in another huge project for the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And um, I, I suspect that my uh, time, my daily routine for the next several years will look very similar. I spend a lot of time talking to colleagues about the work that they're doing on the instrument. I spend a lot of time sort of reading uh, what other people are doing and writing out plans and uh, ideas on what we're supposed to be doing. And I also spend a bunch of time uh, thinking about optics and how to get optics to do all of the magical things that we want to do to accomplish our science. Thank you both so much. We will now have concluding remarks from our president, Eric Isaacs. Nick and Gwen, thank you so much for a, a, a great talk and a really engaging set of, of ideas. It's really amazing what, what instrumentation can do to open up the universe to us. Uh, I also wanna thank all of you in the audience uh, for being here, for your great questions and for your interest in Carnegie Science. I would invite you to our next, um, our next talk, which is gonna be in two weeks on May 28th, um, where we'll have a molecular microbiologist, Devaki Baya, and an astrobiologist, Andrew Steele. And they'll provide us with a really timely look into uh, the complex and fascinating world of viruses. So I hope you'll tune in then. We really appreciate your interest and look forward to welcoming you back again really soon. Thank you. <laughs>